Welcome to An Architecture Podcast, episode 14. In the previous episode, we presented the speech that Tim gave at this year's Porcupine Freedom Festival, which was titled, The Private Ownership of Public Space in Post-State Cities. If you haven't already listened to Tim's speech in episode 13, I strongly recommend doing so before listening to this one, so that you understand the background and the context for what we discuss here. In this discussion, we spend a lot of time expanding on Tim's idea of opt-in trusts as a mechanism for private ownership of public spaces. And we discuss some of the opportunities and challenges of transitioning to a society with more private ownership of these assets. Now, we had originally planned to stick this on to the end of episode 13, directly following the actual speech. So as this conversation starts, just imagine that we've just finished listening to the speech. As Tim says, All right, that was my speech from Porkfest. So Joe, what did you think? I thought you did a great job. It was well-structured. It had some good pacing. You know, it kind of kept moving right along to new ideas. And I think the ideas you presented are pretty original and that I haven't really seen public space discussed kind of in this much detail before in the world of libertarianism or anarcho-capitalism. So I think it's actually a pretty important contribution to libertarian theory, if I'm not being too presumptuous. Well, now that I'm a celebritarian, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm able to make these kind of contributions to the field. I also thought it was a topic that hasn't really been given the attention it deserves, at least from this kind of holistic kind of view. Yeah. People talk about privatization of roads and privatization of parks and all these things as kind of discrete items. But thinking about public space as an overarching kind of organizing principle and then realizing how that solves some of the problems of these other elements of the built environment, I think it's a valuable way to approach it. Yeah, I mean, what I can think of, the, the sort of discussions you usually hear are, are about easements or preventing encirclement or, you know, something regarding the tragedy of the commons or something like that. But yeah, this is the first time I've really heard it presented as a standalone and more, really more general topic. There are a few people who have addressed it directly or, or indirectly. Roderick Long had a piece where he talked about public space. And to some extent, I think that he was representing some similar ideas to what I was talking about here kind of this idea of homesteading public use. Uh, He gave the example of if there's a neighborhood, you know, near a beach and there's a pathway that's been worn kind of through the grasses down to the beach, that that maybe nobody owns that, but that that indicates that that pathway has been claimed for public use. It's kind of this idea of homesteading public use. Yeah, and I have seen some similar points made by guys like Rothbard or maybe Walter Block. Again, probably more in the context of easements for roads or other services. Yeah, Walter Block, of course, Walter Block has written about everything, (laughs) but he does have a focus on kind of physical aspects of, you know, his his motto is to, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Everything either moves or doesn't move, therefore privatize everything. (laughs) And he's written books about privatizing roads, about privatizing waterways. And I think he's, I just recently went back and listened to one of his speeches, and I don't know if it's out yet, but... He's actually, I think he's working on a book about privatizing space as well, <laughs> which kind of, I guess, speaks to my, my point about the guy who's claimed the moon. That's the ultimate public space, right? Space, the final public space. Hans Hermann Hoppe has addressed public space to some extent, and he actually uses it to defend an argument in support of some prohibitions on immigration. And basically what he said is that the way kind of a village develops is that you have public space, unclaimed space, and then individual people kind of carve out their plots of land and build their homes on it. But then the space in between is left over and that becomes the roads and the plazas and all of these things. For a while, that's okay because maybe there aren't enough people for the maintenance of the road to be a problem. But then at some point, a group of people will want to take over ownership of the road in order to start maintaining it. What he says is that traditionally that's been a government, whether a government was formed beforehand or whether the government forms around this idea of kind of taking over and maintaining the public space. He sees this issue of really homesteading public space as being something that is kind of a foundational (laughs) reason for why societies form governments. And the problem is that once that happens, then the government kind of has you trapped, you know, in order for you to get off your property, you have to go onto the government road. And so then they justify forcing you to pay taxes and all this other stuff. So it's basically everything that opponents of privatized public spaces are terrified of is precisely what Hoppe argues has actually happened. <laughs> yeah, 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 I guess so. And in fact, the reason that Hoppe was making this argument is that 
This was in an article about immigration. And he makes the case that these roads, once they're claimed and once they're owned and homesteaded, that the owner of those roads has the right to say who can and who cannot have access to the roads and who can and cannot come on or off that property. And so then he uses this as really a justification for immigration controls, that if people are coming into a, a country and the country owns all these roads and all this public space within the country, that you can't get from whatever country you're coming from anywhere else within the new country without going onto these government roads. And since the government is the owner of these roads, then they as the owner have a right to control access to those roads. And so, of course, that's a point that I was challenging here is my contention is that roads and particularly government roads have a public nature, that roads that have been made available for public use should be respected as public roads, even if they come under private ownership. I don't think that we should grant government as an entity who has claimed ownership of all this public space. I don't think we should grant them the kind of access controls that private property owners may have. Of course, governments do limit access to certain spaces of theirs. But when you talk about roads, this isn't a libertarian market force that has created and built and maintained these roads. These roads are maintained by taxation, by money that the government has taken from people by force. I don't think it represents the same kind of property right that private property owners have, where there could be a broad consensus to allow everybody the right to prohibit people from coming on their property. Right. So this sort of universal common law concept of respect for property rights applies to individuals interacting with each other, but not necessarily to the government, which is an entity that has acquired land through illegitimate means. Yeah, as I said in my speech, this right that property owners claim to exclude and evict people from their private property, I don't think it's a fundamental right of private property ownership. With no other justification, I think that forceful eviction from property is a violation of the non-aggression principle. However, as I said, within society, we often need to have this right or establish this right, which essentially means that there's a broad consensus for people to grant this right to other private property owners. In other words, if you want to have the ability to evict people from your property, you should grant that same right to other individuals. However, when we talk about something like roads, I don't think that governments have really earned that right. Yeah, and it may not be necessary to apply that to the government ownership. And especially with the way that governments act in the real world, it implies that you have the right to throw the government off of your property anytime you want, which I think in most cases, if the government came onto your property, that's not what would happen. <laughs> yeah, right. There are some other articles that have been written. There's an article on Mises.org by Frank Van Dunn. Uh, this is from 2009 called Freedom and Property, Where They Conflict. And he's kind of making the argument along the same lines that I am, where he's saying that you know, public space and public access, you know, what I talked about, kind of roadways or pathways, to get from one place to another, are really fundamental to a functioning society and specifically to a free society where you have some degree of freedom of movement. Of course, we talked about this idea of freedom of movement in episode six and episode seven, and this is something that he's promoting. He makes some arguments for why that makes sense, as you said, to avoid encirclement, which means that basically if you claim a plot of land, that you're going to have some access to that plot of land, that someone can't just buy all the land around you and, and shut you out of your piece of land. And then there was a rebuttal to this Frank Van Dunn article by Walter Block, <laughs> where Block was trying to argue that you could still solve some of these problems like encirclement without restricting property rights. I think that Block viewed Frank Van Dunn's argument for a broader right to public space. Frank Van Dunn called it the free movement proviso. Walter Block was arguing that that isn't really necessary, that, that there are other ways to solve these problems within the principles of property rights. Is this one where he kind of makes an argument that to avoid encirclement, you could drill a tunnel from your property out to the road or something like that underneath someone else's property? I think so. <laughs> and I've heard him say that in other venues, but that's, um, I think that was part of the argument that we're going to helicopter, you know? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Flying cars. <laughs> that's right. The answer is always flying cars. Always. Or shrubbery. So for me, I, as you can see, I, I've landed more on the side of, of Frank Van Dunn. But I think that my point is that this public right to certain types of spaces can be established by the principle of homesteading. As long as we recognize that government on these public rights of way does not and should not have the right to exclude people, other than for reasonable restrictions like traffic laws and possibly fees for use and hours of use, just like any other private property owner would have, and shouldn't be contentious. So some of the ideas you presented about property rights and homesteading 
are probably a little bit controversial among libertarian circles. Did you get any pushback from anyone at the festival after your speech? Um, I did have some discussions with people. I've been trying to remember some of the points people were making, but... Yeah, it's hard to keep track of all the adulation when you're a celebritarian like we are. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I do try to remember all the little people that I've stepped on as I've clawed my way to the top of the libertarian circle of elites. <laughs> I, I did have some good conversations with people after the speech, and then some people stopped by my, my booth later in the weekend and we had some good conversations. I'm trying to remember some specific arguments, but some people just had some different ideas about ways that roadways and things could be dealt with in terms of ownership. Somewhere along the lines of, I think what Walter Block has said that, you know, if you have a neighborhood, that all the property owners in that neighborhood could have a share in ownership of the street where their house is on or, or something like that. I see that to be a bit problematic because for one thing, they don't own that road now. And yes, even though they're likely to be the primary users of that road, that road has been and should continue to be available for public use. So I think that it's more appropriate to have a more public form of ownership of roads where it's not just limiting the abutters to owning a certain piece of property. And that gets tricky, too, because it's like, how far do you draw that circle around a road or a neighborhood or, or whatever where people are claiming ownership of it? And how do you divide up those stakes? Is it, you know, whatever proportion of frontage you have on the road or that gets messy as well? Well, yeah, and there's also a bit of a slippery slope there where, where if everyone has some sort of share and ownership of their street, you can see where it makes sense for them to sort of get together with other people. And, and ultimately, this is what leads to forming some sort of a local government in order to look after all these streets. So, so really, it's almost back to that Hoppe argument where he says that this is exactly how local states formed in the first place. Yeah. And, and you know, I think it's OK to, to have this kind of arrangement. But I think that, again, that, that there needs to be an easement for public use of what are now public government roads. So even if some smaller group of people do take over maintenance of a certain road, there should be an easement there within their deed that grants a public right to pass and repass over that portion of the property as a right of way. And I think that my idea of some kind of more public trust, which I called an opt-in trust, could lead to this process where you have the local property owners essentially owning the road or at least owning maybe a majority of the road. Because by and large, the people who are going to be interested in claiming ownership or opting into the trust for a road are going to be the people who use that road, which means the property owners who have homes and businesses on that road. And even with what I'm calling an opt-in trust, I think that there could be a mechanism for removing that from public ownership, where there's some kind of a buyout process, where maybe a neighborhood organization could essentially buy out the rights of ownership from everybody else who might have a claim to it. And then that could become more of a privately owned road and possibly even have more private access rights to it. So in other words, even though you would originally have an easement for public use of the road, there probably should be some process, and it might be a high bar to get over, but there should be a process for removing that from public use if there's a strong reason to do so. Yeah, I like this idea of opt-in trusts because it gives people the choice of what sort of a role they want to play in the ownership and maintenance of roads. I can imagine that there's some people that would be really interested in determining how roads are built and maintained who would want to do this, but I, I can imagine there's a lot of other people who just don't care and they'd be perfectly happy just to pay some sort of a toll or a fee just to use those roads. And another situation I can see would be someone buying a share in each of the roads that they take on their daily commute to work every day, but staying out of any other roads that they don't use as often. And so this would give them a say on the roads that they use without putting them at risk of owning other roads that they don't use very often. Yeah, I think that's one possibility of this idea is that you know people could kind of pick and choose the roads that they care about, and then those are the ones that they choose to opt into and, and have a say in the maintenance and the funding of. But of course, people wouldn't have to opt into ownership of the roads in order to use the roads. As I've said, you would still want to preserve the access rights for people. But if there are certain roads that people care about, then yeah, they can become owners and then have a say in, in that maintenance. And if you think about if this were to happen on a broad scale, I think that it would probably look a little bit different. You know, essentially all of these roads, it, and there's a question of how you parcel that up. You know, do you have, is each individual road its own kind of ownership trust? Or is there a network of roads, you know, a neighborhood of roads, or even a city of roads that becomes owned under one trust? There are challenges there with understanding the best way to sort that out and kind of slice and dice everything. Yeah, but I could see that all being sorted out through some sort of a market process where you might have a few different trusts that are operating in a certain area. And maybe they buy or sell or trade ownership of certain roads back and forth with each other in order to try to find the most efficient ownership structure for that area. I mean, I really don't think it makes sense to have hundreds or even thousands of these trusts 
in a given town, each operating one or two streets. I think what this would eventually lead to is having a few larger organizations that own and operate a larger number of the streets or other assets in a given area, just because you get more of a division of labor there and, and more of a specialization, where rather than having to raise money every 10 years to repave the road, just like the way a municipal city government maintains roads these days, they just have kind of an ongoing rolling budget and they could schedule out maintenance so that the costs are more predictable. Yeah, I think that's possible. And I think that certainly as we transition from what is now a kind of city ownership of a road network, what's going to make the most sense is divesting that as one unit, you know, so that you would opt into the ownership of what are now city roads. That just becomes one trust and whoever wants in owns that network of roads. And then maybe later on, they, they slice and dice that if it makes sense to do so. But either way, even if you had these smaller ownership entities, they would most likely be hiring out services for road repairs and maintenance and snow plowing. So you would have these larger companies that handle maintenance, but they might have a number of different road clients within an area. This is a way trash removal works in some areas where certain cities pick a waste removal company to come in and pick up all their garbage. And then the next city over might have somebody different or the next city over might have the same company. But the maintenance responsibilities are separated from the ownership responsibilities and they just get hired out by the owners. Now, one problem I see or potential problem I see with this idea of opt-in trusts is there's a question of who gets to opt in to each of these trusts. If you have a city that's going to divest its road network, who gets to be one of these people opting into that ownership? Is it just the people within the city or is it people within a state or within the country or within the whole globe? And is it just people who are alive now or as new people are born you know, within that area, do they have the right to opt in as well? Yeah, it's basically the same kind of conundrum you get with any sort of Marxist or socialist theory, where they try to claim that all unclaimed resources are de facto owned by everybody, rather than what we would claim, which is that they're unowned. And it raises these same kind of questions, especially when you start considering what happens over time and how that ownership gets transferred to new generations. Yeah, I mean, what I would be most interested in is having an arrangement where really anybody from around the world could opt into ownership of some of these assets, just like they can you know, by purchasing a stock of a public company. There really shouldn't be a reason why people who are interested in investing in these properties all around the world uh, shouldn't be able to do so. Now, there might be some concerns there where the road leading to your street becomes owned by some majority of people, you know, living in China or something who really don't know anything about the road and about the way it's used. And that all of these uninterested investors might just come in and stake their claim to try to get some kind of windfall profit and not actually make any investment or improvements to the roads. And another kind of related concern to that is essentially what happened in Russia and some of the Eastern European countries when they privatized a lot of their industries, where they used a voucher program to allow people to claim ownership of what were all of these various government industries. What tended to happen there is that poorer people would get their vouchers and just sell them off immediately because they had higher time preference for the money. You know, they, would, they preferred to have the cash on hand rather than an investment in you know, some potential future cash. And there were a number of reasons for that. You know, people didn't necessarily think that this whole arrangement was going to last, so they were trying to grab what they could while they could. They didn't really understand and believe in the risk and reward system of entrepreneurial investment. And so the end result was that even though this started out as an opt-in kind of form of public ownership, the ownership very quickly became concentrated in the hands of just a few people who didn't need the money right away and could afford to buy up the shares from other people. And of course, there was a ton of corruption and everything, and, and a lot of these industries ended up being monopolies. So it's not a perfect example, but I think that it's a cautionary tale for trying to make some kind of an opt-in trust work where it won't just devolve into ownership by the wealthy. Yeah, and in the talk, one of the points you made was that some of the dividends that are received from these assets once they're established could be distributed almost in the way that something like a universal basic income would be. Now, this is probably an, an area where you get a lot of pushback from free market libertarians, especially on the anarcho-capitalist side of things. I think maybe instead of calling it a universal basic income, you could call it something like a universal dividend or something like that. I think universal basic income implies that there's a certain minimum amount that everyone's going to get. Whereas if you called it a universal dividend, that just implies that it's a dividend that everybody is eligible to receive. Yeah, the point I was making there was not, I think, I think I did say universal basic income, but it wasn't necessarily that you would have this guaranteed dollar amount that everybody gets. My point was that if you allow anybody to opt into ownership of all of these assets, and if a number of those assets can become productive and profitable, then just like ownership of any company stock, 
there could be dividends that get paid out to all the owners. And so my thought was here that if there's no cost for people to claim ownership of a share of these assets, then you could have poorer people who now maybe may not be able to make the initial investments in a stock or bond or other form of investment to start generating that passive investment income. If they can become owners of this windfall of productive assets, then that should be able to generate some dividend income for them that could really be meaningful. So again, this isn't a universal basic income where it's like these assets are going to start generating money and then that's somehow going to get redistributed to everybody. It's that people who do opt into ownership of productive assets will gain the benefits of those, just like any investor in any kind of profitable investment asset. One problem I could see with this is that with zero cost of entry, you'd have everyone jumping in on every possible opt-in trust there was, which would very quickly dilute the amount of dividend that everyone else gets as a result. So I just wonder whether you need some sort of a skin in the game mechanism. For one thing, the reason that companies sell stock is to raise funds for big capital investments or to finance operations. So I imagine you'd want these trusts to have some sort of mechanism to do the same, whether that's selling some sort of stock or taking loans. Now I can see that there would be certain trusts that would be net profitable in the sense that they wouldn't really need any cash injections in order to finance their operations. And I imagine that these are the ones that everyone would jump into, which would very quickly dilute the amount of dividends that anyone's receiving from them. And at the same time, people would get out of any trusts that are underperforming that aren't making a profit. So I think at some stage, you need some sort of a mechanism for people to put skin in the game in order to introduce some more entrepreneurial risk-taking in the management of these trusts. Yeah, I would agree. And I have a couple thoughts on that. The first is that your concern about the dividends being diluted. It's not really an issue. If there's no cost to get into a trust, then yeah, I would expect that to happen, that the more profitable trust will have more people piling in and claiming ownership. And as long as they're remaining profitable, then that shouldn't really be a problem. You know, eventually they're going to reach a point where it's been so diluted that people stop piling into it that nobody really cares anymore. Because even though you're not paying for ownership of these things, there would probably have to be some kind of initial, you know, management fee, just like a like brokerage kind of fee or something. So yeah, you could get to the point where these assets aren't very profitable anymore, or even to a point where they're making a loss. And so there's a question then of how are these trusts and assets raising money to cover their losses and to invest in improvements? And so at that point, I think you would probably have, whether it's a different class of shares or, as you said, kind of another kind of stock offering for people to put money into these things and invest in their improvement. And then there would need to be some delineation between how much those paid investors get versus how much the non-paying investors get in terms of any dividends that those assets produce. Yeah. So I guess as funding requirements increased, I could see some of these evolving from a trust into more of a publicly traded corporation. Yeah, and I think that there could be a mechanism for people who are opting into ownership of these things to sell off their shares. So, you know, I might decide that I'm never going to go to Australia. So I might opt into ownership of whatever assets are available there in Australia, but then sell those off for whatever I can get them for to other people. So even though the initial creation of an ownership stake doesn't cost me anything, there may be a market there where other people who are interested in owning the asset would be willing to buy that from me. Yeah, trust me, you don't want any part of the roads down here. They're all the wrong way around. <laughs> I can't even get people to drive on the right side of the road here. <laughs> One point you made that I thought was really interesting was the idea that if you eliminate government ownership of these public spaces, then that can significantly reduce the role that a government policing agency plays in society. So this could actually be an excellent kind of nonviolent means for anarchists to reduce the role of government in society without having to have any sort of direct conflicts with the police. Yeah, that was a point I would have liked to spend a little more time on. I think for a lot of us who've tried to think about ways of trying to get, you know, from where we are today to some kind of a stateless society, we think that what we need to do is to somehow take down and replace all the existing services that governments provide. And again, governments do provide legitimate services like policing although we often think that they could be done better if they were done privately. But what I realized as I was thinking through this is that you don't necessarily have to privatize the police in order to get to something more like a stateless condition. All you really need to do is to take all the government property and privatize that. And once all of the roads and parks and other public spaces within a city are owned by private owners, and those private owners are responsible for their security and their maintenance and the rule setting on those properties, then what role does a municipal police force have in that society? The individual property owners 
can provide for their own security and should have their own services for resolving conflicts and possibly even beyond the police, you know, for adjudicating disputes, you know, where we talk about private justice systems. Of course, nowadays, if there's a dispute between two private property owners, oftentimes they'll go to a private arbitrator rather than litigation through the government. So I think that if we look at an area as being fully privately owned, it becomes a lot easier to understand how services like municipal police, like government courts, and of course, agencies like, you know, the, the road department and the parks department, understanding how all of those can be replaced. Yeah. And it's also something that can be done in a very piecemeal fashion so that you don't need to have this, this sudden disruptive, you know, anarchist revolution where everything gets privatized. I mean, that's, that's arguably part of the problem with what happened in Russia when all of a sudden everything was up for grabs and there was this massive shift that happened all at once. This is something that could be done, you know, one park at a time, one street at a time. And in the process, you'd be developing these trusts or corporations or whatever mechanisms that were learning how to better manage these assets as they went along and that would develop kind of an entrepreneurial eye for the next best asset to take on. And what this would also do is to legitimize these mechanisms in the eyes of the public where instead of having to have this big public debate about public or private ownership of everything, you could have these small-scale experiments happening. And over time, if they're successful, people would come to actually favor that structure over the government ownership structure. So this sort of approach, I think, is a very workable and real-world sort of a solution to divesting government assets into private ownership. Yeah, and the point to emphasize there is that we don't have to wait for some kind of a libertarian revolution in order for these things to start happening. This idea of opt-in trusts, you could go out tomorrow and, and create an opt-in trust for, you know, let's say you take a park in your town. Someone could go out and create a trust, you know, do the paperwork to establish a trust that would define itself as a potential receiver of that park, you know, if and when the city ever decided that they wanted to divest it. And then from that point forward, they might start to get involved in maintenance of the park and stewardship of the park and organizing events and activities, so that if the time ever comes when the government does want to divest that asset, that you have this organization in place who has proved that they're good stewards of that public asset, and it would become natural then for the government to choose them as the recipient of this government asset. And in some form, some of these organizations already exist. There are a lot of parks that have kind of a Friends of the Park organization that will go around and pick up trash and organize events and publicize the park. Yeah, and there are some private corporations that do own and operate even national parks as well. And another aspect of this process is that even before this trust takes on any ownership of anything, they could have their charter posted publicly for everyone to see so that the public could come to understand how they operate and what their intentions are with the land. As Tim has discussed, they could have provisions in there for, for how they're going to preserve the land. They could have some sort of a pro forma deed restriction that people can read. And, and this could even be kind of an open source process as well where they could be taking input from the community in order to ensure that the rules they come up with are the rules that the people who are using that asset want. Yeah, and again, if it is set up as what I'm calling an opt-in trust, which essentially some of these organizations are now, they're just volunteer organizations that anybody can volunteer for, then of course anybody in the community could get involved with that organization and have input into the decision-making. One thing I was hoping to spend more time on was talking about post-state cities. And this idea that if you have some significant portion of public space and, and what is now government property owned by private owners, how could that impact our cities and the broader built environment? We actually have another episode coming out soon where I was interviewed by Danilo Cuellar of the Peaceful Anarchism podcast. And he started grilling me on some of these ideas about, you know, what do we do with the roads? What do we do with parks? What do we do with public utilities? So in that discussion, I got into a few more specifics of some of these ideas. Before we go, I want to say thanks again to the Free State Project and the organizers of Porkfest for giving me the opportunity to put this together. I was happy to be a sponsor of the event, and hopefully if my new architecture practice goes well, I'll be able to sponsor it again next year. So all you Free Staters out there who want to come to New Hampshire and build your dream home, give me a call. It's not the land titles themselves. The problem is the government. That's what needs to go away. We can keep the land titles, transfer them to private ownership. Let's just get rid of government.